Hi everyone, and welcome to this video on section 1.6, Acceleration Near Earth's Surface. Now anything that's close to Earth's surface is going to accelerate at the same acceleration, which is 9.8 meters per second squared, or negative 9.8 meters per second squared up. Sometimes you'll see this as 9.81, rounded to one more decimal place. Um, and it's going to change very slightly if you're on top of a mountain versus being down in a valley. But overall, it's pretty close to 9.8, and we can take that approximation anywhere on Earth's surface. If we're up maybe in um, something like a plane, it would still be about the same, but if we're in something like the International Space Station, that's where we would really find that value to be quite different. So the subscript G denotes acceleration due to gravity. So sometimes we write that acceleration due to gravity A with a G below it, but sometimes it's just written as a G with an arrow over top of it. And so that would be 9.8 meters per second squared. So what this refers to is uh, specifically a situation where we're going up and we're coming straight back down. That's what we're going to look at today. Later in this course, we're going to look at the idea of actually traveling in a parabola. But for our intents and purposes, what we're going to do is if you turn that parabola sideways and you look as that object gets thrown away from you, what you're going to see, if you just think about turning and being the person throwing that object, you see that object go up and you see that object come back down. So in your frame of reference, you see something go straight up and straight back down. It's one-dimensional. Obviously, the ball is getting smaller as you throw it away from you, but it's going up and coming straight back down. So that's the situation we're going to consider today. So let's look at this example. The top thrill dragster at Cedar Point takes riders up a vertical hill as one of the world's fastest roller coasters. If it needs to have a velocity of 3 meters per second up at its peak, otherwise it's, it would get stuck if it's zero, or if it was negative, it would make it over. And it takes 5.2 seconds to climb the hill. A, what velocity must it be released with at the bottom of the hill in kilometers per hour? Note here the change in units. And then how tall is the hill? And we can answer that in meters. So let's do these, keeping in mind that we have five equations of motion that we've learned in the past to help us do that. If you're using this textbook from Nelson, uh, section 1.6, those five equations of motion were found on page 37. Before I actually solve the problem with you, I want to show you what this ride actually looks like. So let's have a look here. This video is from Cedar Point, and uh, I've actually had the opportunity to be on this roller coaster. It is quite thrilling. You reach speeds of over 100 miles per hour, I believe. So it counts down. And that is one big hill in front of you. A lot of mechanisms in place to ensure safety and very fast acceleration. So as you can see, a very thrilling ride, um, very quick speeds. Unfortunately, even though you wait in line for over an hour, you're only on it moving for about 15 seconds, if that. So I highly recommend going down to Cedar Point sometime, but let's get back to the physics and see actually how they got this to work. So I want us to consider this. Obviously, it went up kind of at a parabola, but consider really what's happening is you're going up, you're going over a little bit, but we're gonna, that's really negligent in what we're considering here. And you're coming back down. So you're going up, and then you're coming back down the other side. So really what's happening on this roller coaster is it's as if they took you on that roller coaster, threw you straight up, and then you fell back down. That's really what's happening here. And so let's have a look at how the math works out. I'm going to say in terms of this velocity, I'm going to consider from the ground, because I'm starting at the lowest point, and it's telling you it takes you 5.2 seconds to climb the hill. So your final velocity is going to be up at the top of this right here. So this will be V final. It's 3 meters per second. And down here, that's what we're trying to figure out. This is V initial. How fast do we need to be released at? And then we know that it takes a time of 5.2 seconds to climb the hill. And we also know acceleration to gravity. We know acceleration to gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared down. All right, so how do we actually 
see these givens play out. I'm just going to write V final down here as well so I can see this. It's 3.0 meters per second up. Obviously, that's it's turned into horizontal motion at that point, but if it was still going vertically, it would go, be going 3 meters per second vertically at that exact instant. And VI is what we're trying to find. So we look at our big five equations and see what one actually gives us those four variables. So we look, we've got five our five equations, which are on an equation sheet that you would have received if you're in my course. And they're also on your lesson and in your textbook on page 37, as I noted. Which one of those equations has all four of those variables? Well, it may be easier to find out which variable it doesn't have. And so you can, we know that it can't be, we don't have displacement here. So it can't be that one, it can't be that one. And it can't be that one. So if you have to go through process of elimination, we can arrive at that question at the equation we want to use like that. Or we could look for all four and find all four. So either way you do it, find the equation you want to use. V final equals V initial plus acceleration times the change in time. So V final, V initial plus acceleration times the change in time. What we need to do right now is we need to rearrange this in terms of V initial. So we're going to subtract A delta T from both sides. This should be a relatively straightforward rearranging. And we get V initial. Two issues here. The first issue is that we're asked for kilometers per hour. Some of us go, but we don't have any kilometers per hour yet. Don't worry about that. We do the conversion at the end. During these calculations, and this is important for all of these, you can put this nice and bolded, all Five equations of motion questions need SI units of meters and seconds. So meters and seconds to calculate. So everything should be converted into meters and seconds in order to actually calculate things here. All right. So now we can set things in, right? wrong. We have this issue to deal with. The fact that one of these is down and the other is up. And so we need to change that. So we can say everything's up or everything is down. They all must have the same direction when I set these numbers in. So I'm going to say up is positive. And if up is positive, then my final velocity is, is positive and upwards. My initial velocity is going to be positive because it's going upwards. But because the acceleration is working against the direction that we're going, it's negative 9.8 meters per second squared up. So in terms of uh, the fact that it's working against us, it has to be negative. So V final, we know is 3.0 meters per second, and we could put up in there, but now that we've stated that everything is up and up is positive, by virtue of the fact that it is positive, that means that it's up. The acceleration, is negative 9.8 meters per second squared up. So we've now accounted for that in the in a sign in front of it. And the time is 5.2 seconds. So our V initial is these two things. And because we're subtracting a negative, we're going to add the two numbers together. And what that gives us are values of 3, 3.0 meters per second, and we're going to add to that 50.96 meters per second. The second squared, the square there and that second canceled out giving us units of meters per second. Meaning that the initial velocity is 53.96 or 54 meters per second at two sig digs. And this is in the upwards direction. So we could conclude at that point, therefore, the initial velocity is 54 meters per second up. But the question asks us in terms of kilometers per hour. So let's do that in terms of kilometers per hour as well. Let's just convert that here. So we've got 53.96 meters per second. And remember the conversions that we did at the beginning of our course. Uh, we're going to say uh, meters, we want to change to kilometers. So I'm going to put meters in the bottom, kilometers in the top. There's 1,000 meters in one kilometer. That's going to cancel out the meters. And now I want to put seconds into hours. So I'm going to put seconds up here, hours down here. That's going to cancel out the seconds. There are 3,600 seconds in one hour. 
In other words, you're taking 53.96, you're multiplying it by 3,600, and dividing it by 1,000. What that gives you is 1.9 times 10 to the 2, or 194.4, 194.4 kilometers per hour. So to two significant digits, we would say it's 1.9 times 10 to the 2 kilometers per hour, which is well over 100 miles per hour. In fact, if you look at the data from Cedar Point's website, it'll tell you that they actually reach 190 kilometers an hour or 120 miles per hour. Very fast. Your face hurts as you accelerate. All right, so that's the first part of it. The second part of it says, how tall is the hill? So let's do that part in this last bit of the video. The second part, part B, how tall is the hill? Well, what do we know? We know that we're trying to find the displacement in this, this case, the vertical displacement. All right, so we're not changing anything in terms of the five equations of motion. We're just doing it vertically. Now, we've literally solved every single variable now except that one. So you could use any of those five equations of motion. Let me just go back to them here so we can look at them. Um, I could use any of these, but the most accurate one is one that doesn't use the calculation that I've just done. And so the one that does that is this equation of motion right here. Notice that it doesn't depend on my initial velocity, which I just calculated. You could use any of them, though, right? There's nothing wrong with using any of them, but this one is likely going to give us the most accurate answer. All right, so let's actually sub this in. So in this case, delta D is equal to V final delta T minus one-half times acceleration due to gravity. That is my average acceleration. That's why I can change that subscript to G times delta t squared. V final, we know, was 3.0 meters per second. Change in time was 5.2 seconds. Minus 1 half, my acceleration to gravity in terms of the positive, we've already gone over this, is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. It's positive is up and acceleration is down. And the time, don't forget to square this, that's a common mistake I see people make is they forget to square that. So we go ahead and we get 15.6 meters because seconds are going to cancel out. And then to that, we're going to add the next value. If you got 25.48, you made a mistake. What mistake would you have made? You forgot to square the 5.2. So make sure you do that and you should get 132.496 meters. When we add these two things together, we get a total of 148.096 meters. So that would be, to two significant digits, we could conclude, therefore, the height of the hill is 1.5 times 10 to the 2 meters. And the actual height, if you're interested, the actual height, and you can Google this and see this, is about 140 meters. So the number we got up above, this 190 meters, was uh, equal to the actual number. The actual number, because we had to route it to Susig Digs, but it's still about 4 kilometers per hour slower. And the actual height is about 10 meters uh, smaller. The reason for that is because of the friction, because the air resistance. And so overall, it's a very accurate picture and works out very nicely. My question for you, though, is this. What happens if it's not actually released at 190 kilometers per hour? Let's watch this video and find out. Uh-oh. Terrifying! got an extra scream out of those riders. Well, from this, I want to summarize a few things and just make sure we're understanding a few terms here. The first is this. We're always going to assume that air resistance is negligible. When something's negligible, that means it doesn't matter, unless otherwise stated. So in the case that we just did, we assumed that there was no friction with the wheels, and we assumed that there was no air resistance, and we got a pretty accurate number. In some cases, the air resistance ends up being pretty large. 
but in our cases, in this course, we're always going to assume it's negligible. Secondly, when you substitute values into the equation, they should all be in the same direction, as we saw with this last question. They should all be in the upwards direction or all in the downwards direction. So that's why it's important to incorporate the direction, but then once you've figured out that they're all in the same direction as we did, they were all up, we were able to sub them in as positives or negatives. Thirdly, in reality, we know that falling objects on Earth reach something called terminal velocity. That's the velocity when the force of air resistance equals the force of gravity. So here you are falling. In physics, we're big about drawing boxes and, and balls. Um, as you're falling, there's a force of gravity pulling you down, but there's also this force of air resistance that's pushing back up on you. We'll say the force of the air. And so when those two things are equal, I'm going to put a little line here, uh, meaning that those are equal, you're not going to accelerate anymore. Again, for our purposes, we're assuming air resistance is negligible, but there is a point when you're skydiving, for example, where you can't get any faster. And the last point I want to make is that on the moon, there is no terminal velocity since there's no air resistance being caused. There's no air, there's no air resistance. So this is the last video I want to show you, and it's dropping a feather and a hammer on the moon. Well, in my left hand, I have a, a feather. In my right hand, a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that uh, where would be a better place to confirm his... Uh, findings and on the moon and uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you uh, the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather for our falcon and i'll uh, drop the two of them here and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time how about that well, I'm not. <laughs> mr galileo was correct in his findings